everybody, it's Ms. Melissa with the Oosterhout Library and our next installment of Harbor Me by Jacqueline Woodson, published by Puffin Books and available from the Cloud Library. Quick before we start, the kind of music I'm playing right now is called Merengue, a music and dance started in the Dominican Republic and there's going to be a reference to it. There's also going to be a reference to a poet named Francisco Alcaron, and I'm doing my best on that pronunciation. He was an American poet who wrote in both English and Spanish. And remember, in this book, necking means slapping somebody really hard over the back of the neck. And that brings us to Brooklyn, where our friends are about to connect, confront some neckers. That day, I remember all of us in the art room leaning in towards each other. But what was frozen in my mind even more than that was later in the day. Ashton, Amari, Esteban, and Tiago left the school together, walking four across, so close that their shoulders were touching. Me and Holly walked behind them, a double wall against the Neckers, who were waiting right outside the schoolyard. Three tall eighth graders who glared at Ashton, but walked backward, away from the six of us. Three tall eighth graders who looked from Amari to Tiago to Esteban to Ashton, then kept looking at me and Holly, then turned and walked quickly, really quickly, away from all of us. Chapter 22. The first time we saw Esteban smile, really smile again, was in December. It was because of poetry. The Thursday night before, he had gotten a letter from his father, who was still in Florida at the detention center. At least he's still in this country, Esteban said, even though he's far away. He's okay, I said. Okay-ish, Holly said, but it's better than nothing, right? Esteban had come down from the windowsill and was sitting with us in the circle. He unfolded the letter from his father. It was written on yellow legal pad paper. Esteban handed it delicately as we all leaned in to look at it with him. His father's handwriting was small and careful, each letter so clear it almost looked typed. He wrote me a poem, Esteban said. He said he has time to write now. He said when he writes, it's like he's back in the apartment with us. Nobody can touch it, he said. We all put our hands down in our laps. Even Holly lowered her needles. That's cool with me, Mari said. Me too, I said, but you can read it to us at least, right? It's in Spanish, Esteban said, but I wrote an English version too, because one day I'm going to be his translator. You guys know what that is, right? We nodded, but Esteban was so excited he explained it anyway. I'm going to rewrite all his poems in English for him, and we're going to sell books in the DR and in America. The DR is the Dominican Republic. When they came for me, the poem read, I lifted my hands to them, let them wrap the cuffs around my wrists. I did not fight, I did not yell. When they pressed me into the van, there were others who spoke our language, a language of sun and ocean and beauty, a language of birds and merengue, they leaned across the van towards each other and knew the same people back home. Always remember, when you are with your people, you are at, you are home. Esteban finished reading the poem and carefully put it back in his notebook. Carefully put his notebook back in his bag. I kept staring at my hands, a stone in my throat like I'd choked to death. I saw my father's head again getting pushed into the police car. Was he crying when it happened? Did he look at me? Did he know that everything was gone? I took another breath and then another. Air wasn't coming in fast enough. Haley, I heard Amari say. You okay, Red? I nodded but kept my head down. It's beautiful, I choked out. He's going to write me more poems, Esteban said. He said he will write them until we're all together again. He's a good poet, Tiago said. He reminds me of the other Paul guy, the one Miss Laverne read us, the one who wrote that poem about a blank white page or something. Alcaron, Holly said. Francisco Alcaron. I tried to remember, but I couldn't. My head felt so heavy. Maybe this was the weight of the world people talked about, the gray ghost that took your breath and your words. How do you even remember that? Amari was saying to Holly. Because she said his name a hundred times, Anne wrote it on the board. Jeez, how do you not remember that? 
Yeah, Tiagu said. That guy. He's going to write me more of them, Esteban said. He promised. And I'll read them in Spanish and English, because it's for both languages. That's what's up, Amari said. Read those poems in all kinds of American, son. When I finally look up, Esteban was smiling. Chapter 23 Outside, the sun is slowly sinking. I hear my uncle drag his suitcase across the floor above me as I listen to Esteban read his father's poem. She's a little bit ahead in the future in this chapter. His voice on the recorder is careful and clear. I wonder if his, he and his dad are walking along a beach together. I wonder if they're working on their books. Esteban finding the English words for his dad as he writes what he sees. Downstairs, my father has stopped playing piano. Now I hear him moving around in the kitchen, pots being pulled from cabinets, the sound of a bottle of seltzer being opened. When they come for me, I lifted my hands to them, let them wrap the cuffs around my wrists. I did not fight. I did not knock, knock. My uncle stands at the door, smiling, a bright orange shirt in his hand. I thought you were going to help me pack. What about this thing? Stay or go? The shirt should go, but you should stay. I turn back to the window, the recorder silent now. Hales, come on. Favorite niece? Only niece. He comes over to me, cups my chin, and gently turns his head up towards him. Turns my head up towards him. His eyes are blue-gray, like my father's. How long has your dad been home? Two months. How many conversations have you had with him? We talk at dinner. My uncle shakes his head. You talk to me at dinner. But I'm not him, Haley. I'm not my brother. I move my head away from his hand, play with the edge of my comforter. All the questions I could never answer, Haley, that's your guy right downstairs. He's as afraid of you as you are of him. I don't say anything. Cousins. What? I look up at him. Don't you want some cousins to boss around? Some big-headed boy cousins or some cutie-cute baby girl cousins? What are you talking about? The sooner I get out of here, the sooner the ladies will come running. The sooner I'll find someone and get busy making you some cousins. Ugh, that's gross. But I'm laughing now. You're so gross and that's TMI. He holds up the shirt again, looks at it for a second, then tosses it on my head. Keep it, he says. I'll bet it looks good on you. By the time I get it off my head, he's gone back upstairs. I close my door, then turn the recorder back on, fast forwarding, past Holly and Tiago and Moramari, and then it's me, telling my story for the first time. While my uncle packs, while my dad plays piano, my own voice from the art room then, but my in my room now. The thing I've never told you guys is that my dad's in prison. Chapter 24, and we're, we're back to the rest of the school year. My uncle and I had been in the car for more than an hour and were finally out of the city. The tall trees had shrunken, the tall buildings had shrunken down into trees and long ribbons of wild, dying grass. The sun wasn't up yet and everything looked like it had been painted in black and dark blue. Years had passed since that afternoon on the slide. A tiny scar shaped like a Z ran from my hairline down behind my right ear. I reached up and ran my finger along it. My uncle used to say being a parent meant long nights and short years. He said before anyone blinked, kids were grown up, packing their bags and moving on. But some things stayed. The scar. The memory of that day on the slide. My mother's nails. My voice on the recorder. Esteban's hugged. I must have slept because when I looked out the window again, we had passed the new Paltz exit and the sun was beginning to rise over the mountains. The sky was burgundy and blue. I've only seen the sky this way driving to Malone. It seems strange that there could be so much beauty and color. And then when you got to Malone, everything was tan and gray and black steel bars and wire. You know, they found Esteban's dad in Florida, I said, staring out the window. Who? Esteban, the guy in my class, my friend. They took his dad, Esteban. 
My uncle glanced at me. Oh, right, I know who Esteban is, he said. I didn't know his dad was gone. But I thought, and then I'd remembered, of course I hadn't told him. We didn't talk to anyone outside the art room about the things we talked about inside it. We talked and talked and talked, but only to each other. The day before, Miss Laverne had found the six of us sitting in the corner of the lunchroom laughing at a character Tiago was mimicking. Even Esteban had thrown his head back and cracked up. We were all huddled into one another, shoulders pressing against shoulders, Holly's legs thrown over mine. Immigration took his dad, I told my uncle slowly. Ah, jeez, Haley, I had no idea. I'm so sorry. I can't believe this crap is happening right in Brooklyn. I looked at him and said, Brooklyn's part of America. I felt tired. Was Esteban awake? Had he gotten another poem? Did they know anything else about what was happening? On Friday, he'd looked like he hadn't slept. He kept his head down in class all, most of the day. He didn't know how to tell my uncle all this without getting so sad and feeling like a dumb kid who couldn't even help her friend. Hales, I'm sorry, he said again. What next for them? What's the plan? Should I reach out to his mother? His mom is hoping some lawyers can do something, but he said that she's packing, packing and waiting. I didn't want to talk about it anymore. Suddenly, it felt like I was betraying Esteban, betraying the art room. Michael was a grown-up. What did he understand about six kids talking? What did anybody, beside me, Diego, Holly, Amari, Esteban, and Ashton, understand? Nothing. Nothing at all. Geez, my uncle said again. Yeah, I said, geez. Outside, the farther we got into the mountains, the faster the wind rushed by the, past the car. I leaned against the window. My uncle drove in silence. The mountains went from burgundy to pink to green and brown. The sun, as always, rose. Chapter 25 This time, when we got to Malone, my dad came down immediately and hugged me so hard I thought my shoulder bones would crack. He and my uncle looked so much alike, no one could say they weren't brothers. But now my dad looked so much older. He had dark circles under his eyes and was wearing the glasses with thick black frames he usually only put on to read. Just couldn't get myself down here last time, my dad said. I'm so sorry. I was having one of those days and it turned into the longest month of my life. I stood there listening to him. I wanted to tell him that when someone drives almost to Canada to see you, you ignore those days. You pushed past them. I wanted to ask him how come I knew this as a kid and he didn't know it as a growing up. But I didn't say any of this. I just nodded and said, It's okay, at least we're together now, right? Because that part was true. I thought about Esteban's father being far away from him and him not being able to visit. I looked over at my uncle. He was standing with his hands in his pockets, his feet a little bit apart. He and my dad both looked so worried and sad. I nodded and said, I get it, Dad, because what if next time he didn't come down again? Or what if the car accident had taken both of my parents from me and he wasn't even here to be mad at? What if my uncle had been in the back seat? My dad hugged me again. His prison uniform felt the same, stiff against my cheek, familiar as daylight. I'd never seen him in anything but those tan khaki pants and a tan shirt with a number on the pocket. After all these years, I should have known that number by heart. There was so much I wanted to remember, so many stories, but his number wasn't one of them. The story of his number was one I'd lock away in a room and write on the door of that memory, the end. Chapter 26 As we drove home that afternoon, I pulled my braids down over my eyes and thought of Kira's hands in my hair. The way they felt soft and warm and sure, strong. The tiny point of her comb making straight parts between the braids. The smell of the lavender oil she rubbed into my scalp. I sat there the way I did every time she did my hair. My eyes closed and my head tilted down. Secretly imagining Kara was my mother. I know that's stupid. Holly was sitting across from us talking away and eating pretzels with peanut butter. I'd imagine my mom had put the bowl there, there where it was between us. I'd imagine she said, 
I've always loved pretzels and peanut butter, Haley. I remember when you were a baby, you grabbed a spoonful of peanut butter out of my hand and shoved it in your mouth. I was so scared. All those stories I've heard about peanut butter allergies and how babies shouldn't have it until they were older. I tried to pry your mouth open with my fingers and scoop it out. But it was Kira talking. Kira who pried Holly's mouth open. Kira sphere. I let out a deep breath and felt my uncle glance over at me. Tell me about her again, I said. The little bit you know. About your mom, right? My uncle said. I figured that's where you'd gone. I nodded. I only knew her a short time, he said. By the time Barry and your dad got really serious, I was already away at college. I hardly ever came home. You know my dad didn't approve, right? Yeah, I said. But he died before I was born, and you and dad used some of the money he'd left to you to buy our house. Too bad, so sad for him, I guess. Are you mocking me? I shook my head. Nope, just saying what you guys always say. Your dad wasn't a nice guy. But at least you got to know your mom, even though you were young when she died. I wish I had known mine. You would have loved her like crazy, Hales, my uncle said. And she would have been over the moon about you. She was over the moon about you. How many times had he started the story the same way? I knew what he'd say next, and in my head I said it with him. Your parents loved each other like that romantic movie kind of love, except it was real. They truly, truly loved each other. My mother and father had met when they were both at Brooklyn College. My mother was studying to be a nurse, and my father wanted to be a teacher. They had some kind of advanced science class together. My uncle was still in high school then. He said my dad told him he'd never even imagined the two of them falling in love. It didn't even feel like a possibility. But when it happened, Michael said, and your dad told me about her, he said, she's the most amazing person I've ever met. You're going to love her. He didn't say, she's the most amazing black person I've ever met. So I was surprised when I first met her. That's racist, I said. No, nope, just the truth. I was a young knucklehead with a skinny brain. And then I wasn't anymore. She changed you, I said. She woke you up. Both of you woke me up, he said. And keep on waking me up. He tapped my head. The sun was starting to set and the sky was a bright orange now. Upstate was so different from Brooklyn. There weren't buildings blocking the sky, and the mountains felt like they were just there to let colors slip through them and around them. Just there to help us see it all. Your mother, he said, would always try to pinch my cheek when I first met her. You're such a cutie, he, she'd say every time she, she saw me. Man, I'd get so mad about it. I mean, I wasn't like some little kid like you. Hey, you know what I mean. I was 15. 15 is almost a man. Almost, uncle. Almost, but not. She was only five years older than me, my uncle said. I always loved to see her smiling, and it was so easy to make her laugh. She, he glanced at me. When you smile, it reminds me of her. I smiled into the window, trying to imagine my 20-year-old not-yet mother pinching my uncle's cheek. I can see her hands, dark, with the bright red polish, but her face and hair were blurred. She was tall, I said, taller than your dad. And someone in her family had red hair too, I said, but not her. Red hair on both sides, my uncle said. You were doomed. I was doomed. My uncle laughed. Behind his glasses, I could see the lines at the edge of his eyes. Crow's feet. That's what he said people called them. The tiny maps of my life, he'd say. They were beautiful. We drove for a while without talking. We were listening to Joni Mitchell, a singer from way back before my uncle was a kid. She was singing about the color green. She had another song about the color blue, but the green song was one of my favorites. Her voice was sweet and high, but she could make it do crazy things and hold notes for so long like it made your eyes water. My uncle sang along with her. There'll be icicles and birthday clothes, and sometimes there'll be sorrow. The story's not complicated. 
Since that time in the hospital, I've asked my uncle about it again and again. I was born when my parents were both 26. Then when I was three, they got into a car accident coming back from a party. My dad was driving, and when they got a block away from home, my dad accidentally hit the accelerator instead of the brake and mowed into a lamppost before swerving the car and hitting the outside wall of a donut shop. It was nearly morning, and the streets were empty, so nobody came when he screamed for help. So he stumbled home to get my uncle to help him get my mom out of the car. She won't move, he kept saying. She won't wake up. My uncle's voice gets quiet when he tells that part of the story. My dad's nose was broken and he had cuts on his hands and arms. My uncle was babysitting me. Before the three of us could get back to the car, the cops pulled up beside us and arrested my dad for leaving the scene of a crime and for drunk driving. He kept saying to me, my uncle told me, go get her, please make her wake up. My mother was six days away from her 30th birthday, but by the time the cops booked my father, my mother had been dead for hours. She'll always be 29. Sometimes I say the word slowly to myself, vehicular homicide. It sounds like a hiccup or the first words to a song. It sounds like the promise of something and then it doesn't. Tell me again about the day after the accident, I ask. My uncle said, I told you your mom and dad both had to go away. I told you I'd keep you safe, though, that you didn't have to worry, and that you'd see your daddy again soon. I told you I loved you and that I'd always take care of you. I said, and I asked you who would take care of me all day, and you said, we're good, Red. I can do it. That I did. That's what you used to call me, I said, before I made you stop. Yep. And I said, does that mean I'm white now? My uncle smiled. You sure did. And I said, nope, you'll always be half white and half black. And that until it turns gray, you'll always have red hair. Tell me again how I made you stop calling me red. You said, my name's Haley, not red. And not quietly either. My uncle laughed. Never heard you have such conviction before that day. I thought about Amari calling me red and how I didn't mind it so much when he said it. And what did you think about how I said it? My uncle said, I thought I'm raising a strong, brave girl. I'm doing something right. I leaned across the car and rested my head against his arm. Sometimes I don't feel so brave. Sometimes I just feel scared, I said. I know, he said. That makes two of us. Chapter 27 You think he's coming back, Ashton said. I don't know his phone number or anything. It was Thursday and Esteban had been absent the whole week. The five of us sat in the corner of the cafeteria, not touching our food while rain slammed against the window. Miss Laverne said she's trying to find out what ha what's happening, Holly said but the number for the, the school has for him is disconnected. Yeah, Mari said. Esteban doesn't have his own phone. Remember, I used to let him play games on mine. Mari stopped take, talking and shook his head. I mean, not I used to. He always plays games on mine. That's what I meant to say, and when he gets back to school, I'm going to keep letting him do it. But, I started to say, no buts, Red. You have to think positive. I don't think he would move away without saying goodbye to us, Ashton said. We're his friends. But they take people, Tiago said. In the night, in the morning, they just take them. Look at his dad. So what if they came in the night and took E and his family? But they can't, Ashton said. Esteban and his sister, both of them were born here. I know, right? Amari said. He looked around the cafeteria. It was loud with the sound of trays banging and kids yelling. Someone blew a whistle and for a moment everything was silent. Then a boy on the far end of the cafeteria held up the whistle he'd blown and it was like someone had turned the sound on. I watched the teacher go over to him and take the whistle away. His dad wrote good poetry, Holly said. Writes, I said. Writes good poetry. They're not dead, guys. Just sucks, Mari said. 
Here we are, trying to have the art room, and boom, it got messed up like this. I mean, Astrobon, he's cool, he's nice. He makes us, the six of us. It's not fair. Nah, it's not, Holly said. This is supposed to be America, the land of the free and home of the brave. Amari was drinking milk, and he laughed so hard it came spraying out of his mouth and nose all over the table and Holly. So gross, Holly said. Oh, my God, you were so, so gross. She wiped her shirt and hands with a tissue. Milk sprinkled on her sandwich, and so she pushed her whole tray away. My bad, Amari said. He was still laughing. Then he stopped and looked at us all. I got one word for you, Amari said. Lenape. What about them? You think they're somewhere saying, well, this is supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave? Nah, man. They were here in Lenape Hoken, a.k.a. New York City, getting robbed. They were getting gangstered by so-called settlers. You missed that whole history lesson? Harley glared at him. No, I didn't miss that whole history lesson, she said, mocking him. Then how are you going to try or how are you trying to erase them? You're doing the same thing the people who took East Dad are doing. Up here trying to erase people, Amari said. No, I'm not, Holly yelled. We got quiet. Amari looked around the cafeteria. People were staring at us. Amari looked around the cafeteria. One of the eighth graders who had necked Ashton gave us the finger, and Tiago, Amari, and Ashton jumped out of their seats and hurried towards them. But the boy put his hands up in an all-cool way and then sat back down. Astra's neck was back to its pale, skinny self. There was something both heartbreaking and awesome about that big boy being scared of some 5th and 6th grade special kids. Come on, guys, Diego said. E will be back. We don't need to be fighting about it. He wouldn't want that. Nah, we all agreed. He wouldn't want that. See you next time on Harbor Me.